Hello, my friends. It's your buddy Phil here, project management trainer and coach. I know lots of you are getting ready to take this exam in 2021 and be one and done with it. I commend you. Keep going down that path of success. But one thing you need to do, you need to fix that exam date. And fixing that exam date is only going to propel you to success in a timely, intentional and sensible fashion because some folks are just thrashing all over the place without focusing their energy and effort on that exam date. You got to focus on one date, my friends. Now, for me, I focused on an exam date, but I kept on moving it and moving it until I got fed up on myself. And I said, look here, Phil, you are going to take the exam on the 25th of June, 2005. So I pushed myself into the exam room almost kicking and screaming, but I knew I had to do it. I had to fix down the date, and that's what I did. And at the end of the day, success. Anyway, for those of you taking the exam, you've probably heard me say, if you're focusing on this channel quite a bit, that you should take a look at the Scrum Guide. And what I want to do today is take a look at that Scrum Guide. I want to give some commentaries as I go through it, and I want to sensitize you to ideas about the exam. So think about this as the Scrum Guide 2020 version from our awesome friends, Ken Schwaber and Jeff Sutherland. But what I'm doing is I'm putting a PMP spin on it, okay? If you want a straight version of the Scrum Guide without any PMP commentary, look on this channel and you'll be able to find a couple of them. One that repeats and one that is just about 25 minutes or so. So getting into the Scrum Guide, which you can get at scrumguides.org, so getting into the very first page of the Scrum Guide, Ken and Jeff tell you they wrote the first version of the Scrum Guide in 2010, but they developed Scrum in the early 90s. Think about that. That is a huge 20-year gap, 20 years from the time they first developed Scrum to the time they wrote the first edition. So you can imagine that this has a lot of thought put into it. And now in 2020, all these years later, think about it, 30 years later, they are now commenting again on how Scrum was formed. It says the Scrum Guide contains the definition of Scrum. Each element of the framework serves a specific purpose that is essential to the overall value and results realized with Scrum. So what I urge people to do if you're new to Scrum and you're practicing it for the first time, keep it intact. Don't start moving stuff around. Keep it intact because it is going to help you. We follow the growing use of Scrum within an ever-growing complex world. We are humbled to see Scrum being adopted in many domains holding essentially complex work beyond software product development where Scrum has its roots. And the truth is a lot of companies are using Scrum, but before you begin tweaking anything, you've got to master it in its intact state. You need to know all the advantages and benefits of it. It's very simple. It's very lightweight, but do not mistake lightweight for simple and therefore I can move anything around. Yeah, it comes across as lightweight and simple, but the more you get into Scrum, you realize, oh my goodness, it sounds simple, but to follow in a methodical, intentional, calculated fashion, which is where you get the best from it, it's not easy. A lot of companies and firms, they have realized, okay, Scrum isn't for us. For those reasons all right so definition of scrum scrum is a lightweight framework that helps people teams and organizations generate value through adaptive solutions for complex problems so the mindset my friends for your exam needs to be i am generating value it's not just about creating products i am generating value through adaptive solutions for complex problems this is what we use for complex problems this is not what you use for simple problems for simple problems, you can use predictive. Simple problems that we know what the solution is from beginning to end, step one, two, three, four, five, you can use predictive. But when it comes to complex, when it comes to anarchy, when it comes to chaos, you need to be thinking about agile and therefore scrum. Now, if you haven't heard me say it before, out of the companies that use agile or say, we are agile in our thinking, they employ agile thinking, well, out of those companies, 70% of those companies say they use Scrum. Think about it. Of all the agile frameworks and methods one can use, Scrum. Why? It should tell you that Scrum 
is successful when employed the right way in the right context. There are some people who are failing miserably trying to be agile in practice only, but not in behavior, not in mindset. So it's very important that we see Scrum as being successful when it's employed the right way. All right, and that's why in the beginning I said, keep it intact, practice it well before diverting and doing other things, you know. So in a nutshell, Scrum requires a Scrum master to foster an environment where a product owner orders the work for a complex problem into a product backlog. The Scrum team turns a selection of the work into an increment of value during a sprint. We call that the PSI sometimes, the potentially shippable increment, but really most folks will call it the increment now. We don't always call it potentially shippable increment anymore, but there's nothing wrong in that. Just know that there are multiple ways you could refer to it. The Scrum team and its stakeholders inspect the results and adjust for the next sprint. And we're calling that the retrospective and then repeat. So those are the four steps that we talk about in Scrum. Scrum is simple. Try it as is and determine if its philosophy, theory, and structure help to achieve goals and create value. It's a key thing. It does seem simple. It does sound simple. But I tell you, Scrum, to practice it, it needs a lot of discipline. That is not simple. And that's why a lot of companies fizzle out and they're using all sorts of other frameworks, all sorts of crazy frameworks, which they shouldn't be using. You know, we often hear, oh, Scrum is not working here because blah, blah, blah. They think it's not scalable, but it absolutely is scalable. It is. It just needs patience and it needs you to have in the background the agile manifesto values and principles. If you do that, you'll succeed. The Scrum framework is purposefully incomplete only defining the parts required to implement Scrum theory. Scrum is built upon by the collective intelligence of the people using it. Rather than provide people with detailed instructions, the rules of Scrum guide their relationships and interactions. So what do we mean by some of these rules? For example, we've got three roles, and those three roles, we want to keep them intact. And those are the three roles we identify. That is not to say there couldn't be other roles in the company, but in order to keep that Scrum pure, approach intact so you can really understand it embrace it and then build on it just keep it like that don't introduce anything else practice it and as you practice it through the years you'll find out why we have three roles five ceremonies right three artifacts there's a reason various processes techniques and methods can be employed within the framework scrum wraps around existing practices or renders them unnecessary scrum makes visible the relative efficacy of current management, environment, and work techniques so that improvements can be made. Let's talk about Scrum theory. Scrum is founded on empiricism and lean thinking. Empiricism asserts that knowledge comes from experience and making decisions based on what is observed. Lean thinking reduces waste and focuses on the essentials. So for your exam, understand empiricism is key. Whenever you're talking about what you're going to do, what you can do for a customer, for a client, it should be based on empiricism. It should be based on real values from real experiences that you've had as a team. For example, velocity. We don't just throw out a velocity and say, oh, we're going to do 40 story points. No. You should first of all have an idea of what the team can do. But as you move from sprint to sprint, you are fine-tuning your understanding using empirical data about what exactly the team can do. So we don't throw out bogus promises, we throw promises that we have tested and tried and found to be true. Those are the ones we put in the bucket, not just any old promise. So when you think about Scrum, empiricism is key. And then lean thinking. We want to reduce waste. We want to focus on the essential. So we don't have meeting after meeting for hours and hours on end. We have a 15-minute stand-up meeting. Keep it short and sweet. And then we time box a lot of the activities that we carry out. A lot of the ceremonies, they are recommended time boxes. And it's to help us, to help us avoid wasting time. Scrum employs an iterative incremental approach to optimize predictability and to control risk. Scrum engages groups of people who collectively have all the skills and expertise to do the work and share or acquire such skills as needed. You know, we talk about T-shaped skills. We talk about paint drip. We talk about the broken comb. That is pretty much what this is saying. This is really just sensitizing you to understand 
when you've got a scrum team, we want a group of people who collectively have all the skills and expertise to do the work and the keyword share or acquire such skills as needed. So one of the terms that you'll hear in the Agile Practice Guide is I-shaped. What is wrong with an I-shaped profile? An I-shaped profile is someone who has no intention or interest in doing what is described here, acquiring skills that are needed. Some people, they are like one-trick ponies. That's I-shaped. We don't want to be like that. We want to be T-shaped at worst, but better still, we want to have the broken comb profile, varying degrees of specialisms, not just a one-trick pony, but varying degrees of specialisms. Scrum combines four formal events for inspection and adaption within a containing event, the sprint. So think about it. Those events, they're really ceremonies. We call them ceremonies events. So you have the container, which is the sprint. Inside the sprint, you'll put in sprint planning, you'll put in the daily scrum, you'll put in the sprint review, and you'll put in the retrospective. And that's how you get five ceremonies. But don't forget, we have another ceremony, which is informal. And I can see why Ken and Jeff wouldn't put this as a formal ceremony, because this should be a way of life. It's something that the product owner should be thinking about and doing all the way through whether we have the development team along with him or her or not. And it's the backlog refinement ceremony, which is not a formal ceremony, because it's something that should happen all throughout. Now, when it is taught, we typically tell you this happens in the middle, somewhere in the middle of the sprint, and that's okay. But it's not a formal ceremony because with or without the development team working with the product owner, the product owner has the responsibility of refinement. It's something that should be done all throughout. So let's talk about transparency. The emergent process and work must be visible to those performing the work as well as those receiving the work. So when you think about that for your exam, you need to be thinking about the information radiator. You need to be thinking about displays, osmotic communication, and things like that that help people understand where are we? What are we doing? What's coming down the pipeline? What is close to the end zone? What do we need to do to move this close to the end zone? That's the idea. So with Scrum, important decisions are made based on the perceived state of its three formal artifacts. And I've told you about these artifacts. We have the product backlog, the sprint backlog, and the increment, also called potentially shippable increment by some folks even till today. Artifacts that have low transparency can lead to decisions that diminish value and increase risk. Transparency enables inspection. Inspection without transparency is misleading and wasteful. Let's talk about inspection itself. The scrum artifacts and the progress towards agreed goals must be inspected frequently and diligently to detect potential undesirable variances or problems. To help with inspection, Scrum provides cadence in the form of its five events. Inspection enables adaptation. Inspection without adaptation is considered pointless. So think about it. I often say during exam prep that prevention is better than kill. Prevention is like quality assurance. Cure, on the other hand, is like quality control. So think about it. If you do quality assurance, you should also do quality control. But if you do quality control and you don't do quality assurance, it's not productive. Inspection without understanding why you have the problems you have and without tweaking it is futile. So the idea is as you inspect, you adapt. Inspection enables adaptation. Inspection without adaptation is considered pointless. Scrum events are designed to provoke change. Let's talk about adaptation. If any aspects of a process deviate outside acceptable limits, or if the resulting product is unacceptable, the process being applied or the materials being produced must be adjusted. The adjustment must be made as soon as possible to minimize further deviation. Adaptation becomes more difficult when the people involved are not empowered or self-managing. And that's the key word for your exam. You need to remember that a team is not just self-leading, but also self-managing. A scrum team is expected to adapt the moment it learns anything new through inspection. And that's why we need to empower the team. Now, for your exam, one of the concepts is employing people who are adults people who we trust, people who we know not only will get the job done, but will interact in a mature fashion. And that's why we say once you've got a team flying at ultimate altitude, don't bring them down by 
causing the team to disband. You know, we talk about the five stages of team development, forming, storming, norming, performing, and adjourning. The adjourning stage is a poor stage. It's a bad stage because companies that enable teams disband, that's the adjourning stage. And after all that synergy and time and effort has been spent in getting the team to synergize now you're separating the team well another team has to be formed and they have to go through those five stages again what a waste of time so we want the team to be self-organizing self-managing self-leading once we get the team together keep them there just help them stay there a scrum team is expected to adapt and to adapt everyone needs to be on the same page now for your exam one of the things we talk about is Getting the team to consensus, getting the team to be moved towards a common goal, a common decision. And to do that, you need to remember we have things like voting, fist of five, just straight voting, thumbs up, thumbs down. And of course, the Jim Highsmith decision spectrum. Don't forget that for your exam. But adaptation is key. And in order to adapt, we need a team that can adapt. Let's talk about scrum values. Successful use of Scrum depends on people becoming more proficient in five values. And those five values are commitment, focus, openness, respect, and courage. So at the base of Scrum, what Ken and Jeff have done in this edition is condition our minds to what we should be thinking and how we should be behaving even before touching any of the artifacts or going into any of the ceremonies. So the Scrum team commits to achieving its goals and to supporting each other. That's commitment. Their primary focus is on the work of the sprint to make the best possible progress towards these goals. The Scrum team and its stakeholders are open about the work and the challenges. So think about those two sentences first. We're committing to the goals, and then we are focusing on the work of the sprint, and then we are being open and honest. We are being transparent. And that is important. So the Scrum team and its stakeholders are open about the work and the challenges. Scrum team members respect each other to be capable, independent people and are respected as such by the people with whom they work. The Scrum team members have the courage to do the right thing, to work on tough problems. So we're talking about courage to work on tough problems. So think about it. Phil is one of your team members. He's right there in front of the Kanban board. He's staring at a very, very difficult user story. Yeah, we've broken it down to the user story level, but in his mind, it's still at the epic level. Well, Phil needs to have the courage to pick that user story and to work it as a team member that has the capabilities. Have the courage to do the right thing to work on the tough problems. A team has broken it down. You know it's not an epic anymore. And even if it were, you can do it, Phil. So if you have any issues with it, have the courage to say, hey team, um, I don't think we've broken it down sufficiently. Courage all the way. So commitment, focus, openness, respect, and courage. These values give direction to the scrum team with regards to their work, actions, and behavior. The decisions that are made, the steps that are taken, and the way Scrum is used should reinforce these values, not diminish or undermine them. The Scrum team members learn and explore the values as they work with the Scrum events and artifacts. When these values are embodied by the Scrum team and the people they work with, the Scrum pillars of transparency, inspection, and adaptation come to life, building trust. So for your exam, I just want to emphasize commitment, focus, openness respect and courage so i don't know if you have a cfo but this spells c f o r c cfos respect courage it's an easy way of remembering it let's talk about the scrum team the fundamental unit of scrum is a small team of people a scrum team the scrum team consists of one scrum master one product owner and developers Within a scrum team, there are no sub-teams or hierarchies. It is a cohesive unit of professionals focused on one objective at a time, the product goal. So I want you going into your exam to think about it like this. We may not see the word developers being used on the PMP exam every single time. You may not. But you might have the word development team. You might find the word team. Now, you've got to balance it and weigh it. In what context? Are we talking about the scrum team? If it doesn't say Scrum Team, you got to weigh the question well so that you know, is it talking about these three characters or is it talking about just the developers? 
Okay, so you got to weigh it and you got to be very comfortable with the lingo. But when we say scrum teams, this refers to those three roles. Scrum teams are cross-functional, meaning the members have all the skills necessary to create value each sprint. In other words, T-shaped, broken comb, paint drip, remember, not I-shaped people. You know, in the Agile Practice Guide, we talk about I-shaped people. No, you don't want to be I-shaped. You want to be, at worst, T-shaped, better still broken comb, paint drip. They are also self-managing, meaning they internally decide who does what, when, and how. The scrum team is small enough to remain nimble and large enough to complete significant work within a sprint, typically 10 or fewer people. In general, we found that smaller teams communicate better and are more productive. If scrum teams become too large, they should consider reorganizing into multiple cohesive scrum teams, each focused on the same product. Therefore, they should share the same product goal, product backlog, and product owner. So when people say, oh, Scrum isn't scalable, well, Ken and Jeff have just given you a blueprint to use organically. If Scrum teams become too large, meaning that we need to scale them up, we should consider reorganizing them into multiple cohesive Scrum teams. And you know we use the term Scrum of Scrum, so if you haven't taken a look at the definition of Scrum of Scrums for your PMP exam, I highly recommend that you do that. The Scrum team is responsible for all product-related activities from stakeholder collaboration, verification, maintenance, operation, experimentation, research, and development, and anything else that might be required. They are structured and empowered by the organization to manage their own work. Working in sprints at a sustainable pace improves the Scrum team's focus and consistency. The entire Scrum team is accountable for creating a valuable, useful increment every sprint. Now, I just want to touch on that really briefly because a lot of times when we hear useful increment or potentially shippable increment, there's a tendency to think we need to ship. You do not need to ship at the end of every increment. You could choose to have multiple increments in a release and you could choose to release months after the very first increment when you've got enough increments. I also want you to be aware of terms such as the minimum viable product, which is really referring to the valuable feedback that you get from a customer to determine if the product is viable. And that's why we call it minimum viable product. What is the tiniest amount of product or the tiniest thing that we can deliver to our clients so we can get feedback as to if the product is viable? And if it's not viable, we need to learn quick. So a lot of times people think of an MVP as having to be a product or maybe even having to be some sort of prototype. No, it doesn't have to be. Your minimum viable product could be a water cooler conversation. It could be a survey. It could be interaction. It could be watching a stakeholder interact with a prototype. And through their interaction, even without saying a word, you realize, oh, this is definitely not going to work. This is not a viable product. So understanding the MVP is important. Then understanding the MMF, the minimum marketable feature, and the MMP, minimum marketable product, those concepts are also important. Now, when we talk about minimum viable products, we want to know if the product is viable. When we talk about minimum marketable products, we want to know, is this marketable? Is this something that would add value to our customers? Is this something that they would buy? What is the minimum amount of functionality that needs to be inside this product before it can make sense to be marketed? Minimum marketable product. But at the same time, after you determine the minimum marketable product and you've released the product... The next level of thinking is, can we have more features added to this thing? And if so, when should we do it? Minimum marketable features. What are the minimum marketable feature sets that we can include in this thing that would make sense to actually market this set of features? Have this release, if you will. But a lot of times you hear people just say MVP meaning the same thing each and every time, but that's not the case. So you need to know MVP, MMP, MMF, keep them in the back of your head. I do not think those folks doing the PMP will have a lot of stuff about MMP and MMF, but in the context of Agile and Scrum, it does help you to understand where these fall in. So the entire Scrum team is accountable for creating a valuable, useful increment every sprint. Scrum defines three specific accountabilities within the Scrum team, the developers, the product owner, and the Scrum master. Let's talk about them one by one in our next episode. I hope you enjoyed this first episode of the Scrum Guide with PMP exam commentaries. If you found this to be useful, my friends, I would like for you to give this a big old thumbs up, share with your friends, and I look forward to seeing you on the next episode. Hey, but before we go, 
I have some questions for you. What are the five ceremonies in Scrum? I'll give you 10 seconds. Okay, three, two, and one. The five ceremonies in Scrum, you got to understand, first of all, the big old container, the sprint. Now, inside the sprint, you've got sprint planning, you've got the daily Scrum, you've got the sprint review, and you've got the sprint retrospective. Well done. Next question. What is the optional ceremony that I told you about in the world of Scrum? Three, two, one. The optional ceremony I mentioned, which is not identified as such, but is an informal ceremony, is backlog refinement. Next question. What are the three artifacts from the world of Scrum? Three, two, one. One, the three artifacts, product backlog, sprint backlog, and the increment or potentially shippable increment. Regarding products that we derive from an endeavor, I mentioned three terminologies, MVP, MMP, MMF. What do they stand for? I'll give you 10 seconds for this one. Three, two, one. The three terms, MVP, minimum viable product, MMP, minimum marketable product, and MMF, minimum marketable feature. I advise you to know these really well, and I'm going to define it one more time for you. When we talk about an MMF, it's a small self-contained feature that can be developed quickly and that delivers significant value to the user. The full term minimum marketable feature is not widely used in practice. However, the concept lines up nicely with the first principle behind the Agile Manifesto. Our highest priority is to satisfy the customer through early and continuous delivery of valuable software. The concept supports the idea that software you release to your customer, even if you're doing it frequently, should provide some added benefit and allow your customer to accomplish something they weren't able to before. The term marketable describes the idea that the feature provides value to the customer because value can be defined in a variety of ways, including increasing or protecting revenue and reducing or avoiding cost. The MMF concept is applicable to both external products intended for sale outside the organization and internal products for use inside the organization to support the delivery of the organization's product and services. Now, MVP is also known in the Agile community incorrectly as other things. So some people say MMF is the same as MVP. No, it's not. MMF is about delivering value to customers, whereas MVP is about learning more about the ultimate product. Like I told you, the key thing is feedback. And MVP could range anywhere from not having any MMFs to having a single MMF to having several MMFs. They are not the same concept. You could find out if a product would fit the use and be viable to the customer by asking questions. You may not even have a single feature. And all of this great stuff is from the Agile Alliance. You want to take a look at the definition for MMF. It's right on point. Now, let's read the definition for MVP. A minimum viable product is a concept from Lean Startup that stresses the impact of learning in new product environments. Eric Ries describes MVP as that version of a new product which allows a team to collect the maximum amount of validated learning about customers with the least effort. The validated learning comes in the form of whether your customers will actually purchase your product. A key premise behind the idea of MVP is that you produce an actual product which may be no more than a landing page or a service with an appearance of automation, but which is fully manual behind the scenes that you can offer to the customers and observe their actual behavior with the product or service. Seeing what people actually do with respect to a product is more reliable than asking people what they would do. The expected benefits of the MVP. The primary benefit of an MVP is you can gain understanding about your customer's interest in your product, 
without fully developing the product. The sooner you can find out whether your product will appeal to customers, the less effort and expense you spend on a product that will not succeed in the market. So the idea is use MVP when you're talking about viable, viability of a product. Use the term MMF when you're talking about minimum marketable features that you deliver after the product has been produced. Subsequent releases, that's the idea. Now, we also have the term minimum marketable product. Now, minimum marketable product, we know the product is viable, but what is the minimum marketable product? The key word being marketable. It's another concept that encourages businesses to create a minimum offering, which is based on the idea where less is more. Companies that do not think about the minimum marketable product are going to go off on a rabbit trail trying to create everything under the sun in the first release of a product and therefore will not be first to market. In other words, they're going to be left behind. That is not what we want. We want to understand that every product has early adopters. The question is, can we get this out, the minimum amount of product to get to our early adopters to get the raving fans to use it and to build some momentum before we start thinking about MMFs that are going to be put on top of that MMP. All right. I hope that explained this concept to you because I went through it pretty quick during the training. Now, let me ask you one more set of questions. What are the three roles in Scrum? Three, two, and one. Product owner, Scrum Master and developers. Sometimes we refer to them as team. But remember, collectively, Product Owner, Scrum Master and developers or Product Owner, Scrum Master and team, we refer to them as the Scrum team. In which Scrum ceremony does the customer inspect the deliverable? Three, two, one. The answer is sprint review. What are the three questions asked in the daily scrum? Three, two, and one. Now this one, I haven't taught in this section, but I'm gonna give you an inkling into the next session we have. The three questions are as follows. These questions are pretty clear in a book written by Ken Schwaber, Agile Project Management with Scrum. He writes, each team member should respond to three questions only. One, what have you done since the last daily Scrum regarding this project? Two, what will you do between now and the next daily Scrum meeting regarding this project? And three, what impedes you from performing your work as effectively as possible? Now, there have been so many variations of this work this has been asked as, what did you do yesterday? What are you going to do today? What are the impediments in your way? Another way we've heard it most recently is, what have you done since our last daily scrum to propel the team forward to achieving its sprint goal? You see the difference here? We are focusing on what has been done to move us towards the goal of the sprint. And then the next question is, what are you going to do between now and our next meeting to move us closer to our sprint goal? And last but not least, what, if any, are impediments that are in your way? And that, my friends, brings us to the end of this very quick review of the world of Scrum from a PMP exam prep lens. This is just the very first episode. We're going to have other episodes. So again, share this with your buddies if you like it. I'd like you to let me know. Thank you very much and talk to you soon. It's your project charter, buddy. Uh-oh. Uh, uh. Get your project charter, buddy. Get your charter, buddy. Charter, buddy. Hello, my fellow project managers. Welcome to episode two of Scrum, the Scrum Guide with a PMP exam commentary with your buddy Phil. Today, we're going to start off from page five where we stopped. 
The last sentence we read was, the entire scrum team is accountable for creating a valuable, useful increment every sprint. Scrum defines three specific accountabilities within the scrum team, the developers, the product owner, and the scrum team. Let's talk about the developers. Developers are the people in the Scrum team that are committed to creating any aspect of a usable increment each sprint. Now, when we say any aspect, we mean any aspect. And we also mean anyone doing any technical work, whether that technical work is coding, whether it is engineering, whether it is food design, whether it is a ceremony being managed, whatever it is. Whatever our deliverable is, the people involved in the actual work, we call them developers. The specific skills needed by the developers are often broad and will vary with the domain of work. However, the developers are always accountable for creating a plan for the sprint, the sprint backlog, instilling quality by adhering to a definition of done, adapting their plan each day towards the sprint goal, and holding each other accountable as professionals. Now, there's a difference between holding yourself accountable versus you holding me and you accountable. And that's what we call mutual accountability. And this is a big thing in the world of Agile. It's a big deal because in a lot of teams, people say you're responsible for yourself and you take accountability. But no, we take accountability both ways. I hold you accountable, you hold me accountable, holding each other accountable as professionals. Let's talk about the product owner. The product owner is one of my favorite roles. I call this the chief value officer. The product owner is accountable for maximizing the value of the product resulting from the work of the scrum team. How this is done may vary widely across organizations, scrum teams, and individuals. The product owner is also accountable for effective product backlog management, which includes developing and explicitly communicating the product goal, creating and clearly communicating product backlog items, ordering product backlog items, and ensuring that the product backlog is transparent, visible, and understood. The product owner may do the above work or may delegate the responsibility to others. So when you read the Scrum Guide, don't feel that it's all on the product owner. Absolutely not. The product owner can involve the team in any of these responsibilities, any of these accountabilities, to use the proper word. When we say accountable, we mean ultimately answerable. So regardless, the product owner remains accountable. Think about it. Developing the product goal, communicating that product goal, creating and clearly communicating product backlog items, ordering product backlog items, ensuring that the product backlog is transparent, visible, and understood. These are the ultimate accountabilities of the product owner. It's a big task. And for that reason, the product owner should sensibly, of course, delegate to others. For the product owner to succeed, the entire organization must respect their decisions. These decisions are visible in the content and ordering of the product backlog and through the inspectable increment at the sprint review. The product owner is one person, not a committee. The product owner may represent the needs of many stakeholders in the product backlog. Those wanting to change the product backlog can do so by trying to convince the product owner. So the product owner is a very powerful position and of course, there's no abuse of power, but with great power comes great responsibility. And with all of this power that the product owner has comes great accountability. The product owner is accountable. Could they delegate stuff to other people? Yeah, but there's still some stuff they need to pick up. And these accountabilities cannot be compromised. This is what makes Scrum, Scrum. Let's talk about the next role. Scrum Master. The Scrum Master is accountable for establishing Scrum as defined in the Scrum Guide. They do this by helping everyone understand Scrum theory and practice, both within the Scrum team and the organization. So when you think about the Scrum Master, going back to your exam focus, we talk about a servant leader. The Scrum Master should be a servant leader. And if you remember correctly, one of the roles of the servant leader is to coach, mentor, train the organization as far as Agile is concerned. 
So the Scrum Master is accountable for the Scrum Team's effectiveness. They do this by enabling the Scrum Team to improve its practices within the Scrum Framework. Scrum Masters are true leaders who serve the Scrum Team and the larger organization. The Scrum Master serves the Scrum Team in several ways, including coaching the team members in self-management and cross-functionality, helping the Scrum Team focus on creating high-value increments that meet the definition of done, causing the removal of impediments to the Scrum Team's progress, and ensuring that all Scrum events take place and are positive, productive, and kept within the time box. Now, going to your exam, one of the common questions you hear is, who is responsible for facilitating the daily Scrum? And of course, people often say, oh, it's the Scrum Master. But that is not the right answer. The right answer is it is the responsibility of the team as far as that meeting actually holding, making sure the meeting holds is the responsibility of the Scrum Master. Facilitating the meeting is a whole nother ball game. Now, if the Scrum team asks the Scrum Master to help facilitate it, by all means. But if that is not a request, the Scrum Master does not automatically assume the responsibilities and the accountabilities of facilitating that meeting. There are many things that we can leave to the team except the team requests it, okay? So let's talk about them one by one. Coaching the team members, helping the team to focus, causing the removal of impediments, and ensuring that all Scrum events take place and are positive, productive, and kept within the time box. The Scrum Master serves the product owner in several ways, including helping find techniques for effective product goal definition and product backlog management, helping the Scrum team understand the need for clear and concise product backlog items, helping establish empirical product planning for a complex environment, and facilitating stakeholder collaboration as requested or needed. So the Scrum Master works side by side with everyone, including the product owner, to ensure that the product owner gets the best outcome, to make sure the team gets the best that they can get from all the associations. So when you think about the Scrum Master, this is not a replacement for the project manager in the world of Agile. No, it's very different. The Scrum Master serves... The Scrum Master is not at the center of attention. Instead, the Scrum Master helps people that need to perform their work get it done, get it done more effectively. The Scrum Master serves the entire organization as well. So let's read. The Scrum Master serves the organization in several ways, including leading, training, and coaching the organization in its Scrum adoption, planning and advising Scrum implementations within the organization, helping employees and stakeholders understand and enact an empirical approach for complex work and removing barriers between stakeholders and scrum teams. Now, do remember to balance this up with whatever you can find in the Agile Practice Guide. Remember, the Agile Practice Guide talks about these roles differently. When we talk about the Agile Practice Guide's account of the three roles on a team, an Agile team, you got to remember that there's a different spin. So let's take a look at this account in the Agile Practice Guide. So, on page 40 of the Agile Practice Guide, it says, In Agile, three common roles are used. Cross-functional team members, one, two, product owner, and three, team facilitator. Now, you do know where this is going. Cross-functional team members really means developers in the world of Scrum. Product owner is product owner. Team facilitator really means Scrum master. Now, when we take a look at the details, it says, Cross-functional teams consist of team members with all the skills necessary to produce a working product. Product owner, the product owner is responsible for guiding the direction of the product. Product owners rank the work based on its business value. And then it says team facilitator. The third role typically seen on agile teams is a team facilitator, a servant leader. This role may be called project manager, scrum master, project team lead, team coach, or team facilitator. Phew, there's a lot of information here, but we're not going to cover all of it. But I want you to be aware, as you prepare for your exam, the world of Scrum is different from the broader world that PMI describes. But of course, very similar in name. But you need to know when am I speaking pure Scrum and when am I speaking PMI Agile speak. 
It is going to help you for the exam to understand the world of the PMI and the world of Scrum as pure as it is accounted for in the Scrum Guide. But in my mind, understanding Scrum really well is going to help you because the Agile Manifesto comes to life when you read the Scrum Guide. It's no surprise because Ken and Jeff were part of the co-creators of the Agile Manifesto. The values and the principles, they co-sign them. So of course, we expect to see those Agile Manifesto values and principles in the very essence of Scrum. Let's move on to the next section, Scrum Events. The Sprint is a container for all other events. Each event in Scrum is a formal opportunity to inspect and adapt Scrum artifacts. These events are specifically designed to enable the transparency required. Failure to operate any events as prescribed results in lost opportunities to inspect and adapt. Events are used in Scrum to create regularity and to minimize the need for meetings not defined in Scrum. Optimally, all events are held at the same time and same place to reduce complexity. So here's the idea. You have one overarching ceremony called a sprint. Within the sprint, you have sprint planning, the daily scrum, you've got the sprint review, you've got the sprint retrospective. That makes five, including the container itself. Now, every single event contained in the sprint, those are opportunities for the inspect and adapt mechanism. Inspecting the artifacts, inspecting whatever is progressing, inspecting the team itself, and adapting. It is so vital that we not only inspect, but we adapt. Remember, inspection without adaption is useless. So we need to inspect and adapt. Let's jump straight into the sprint, page 7 of the Scrum Guide. Sprints are the heartbeat of Scrum where ideas are turned into value. They are fixed length events of one month or less to create consistency. Now, let's hold on to that real close because on your exam, if you are asked what is the typical length of a sprint or what is the typical iteration in iteration-based agile, the right answer would be two weeks. That is not to say that we cannot have two-month iterations. They are rare these days. That is not to say we couldn't have a one-week iteration. We could, but in industry, we find most companies going with two weeks. So hold on to that. So fixed-length events of one month or less to create consistency. A new sprint starts immediately after the conclusion of the previous sprint. So if you stopped the first sprint on a Friday, guess what? On a Monday, you're coming into a new sprint. That's the idea. All the work necessary to achieve the product goal, including sprint planning, daily scrums, sprint review, and sprint retrospective happen within sprints. During the sprint, watch this, no changes are made that would endanger the sprint goal. So hold on. Once we get into the sprint, we're going to lock that sprint down, and we're going to make sure that we do not endanger the sprint goal. At that point, we do not want to encourage needless change. If change needs to happen, it better be for a good reason. And of course, it needs to go through the product owner. So if the product owner shuts it down, ain't going to happen. During the sprint, quality does not decrease. Remember, technical excellence and good design enhances what? Agility. So in the spirit of the Agile Manifesto, we are not going to allow quality to decrease. We're not going to sacrifice quality for speed. No. The product backlog is refined as needed and scope may be clarified and renegotiated with the product owner as Moise learned. Sprints enable predictability by ensuring inspection and adaptation of progress towards a product goal at least every calendar month. When a sprint's horizon is too long, the sprint goal may become invalid. Complexity may rise and risk may increase. Shorter sprints can be employed to generate more learning cycles and limit risk of cost and effort to a smaller time frame. Each sprint may be considered a short project. So hold on to that thought because I really want you to think about this. The reason why we decide as short sprints as possible is to limit risk. 
It's a risk coping mechanism. In fact, when you take a look at the entire framework, the entire Scrum framework, what you realize is everything is a risk coping mechanism. The cadence is a risk coping mechanism. The three artifacts keeping them lean and mean, again, it's a risk coping mechanism. It's to make sure we don't waste time. It's to make sure we keep it lean and mean. So the way we do what we do in Scrum is all geared at risk coping mechanisms. So shorter sprints, we want to learn quick. We want to minimize risk, limit risk, limit the cost and the effort so that we can get as much value as possible without putting everything else at risk. So taking those baby steps, it's helping us. It's a risk coping mechanism. Various practices exist to forecast progress like burn downs, burn ups or cumulative flows. Now, these are in your agile practice guide for your exam. Know the difference between a burn down chart, a burn up chart and a cumulative flow diagram. All is useful. It's all going to help you to better understand whatever they're talking about on the exam. While proven useful, these do not replace the importance of empiricism. In complex environments, what will happen is unknown. Only what has already happened may be used for forward looking decision making. So you're on a project and you've done three sprints and you did 50 story points in the first one, 55 story points in the next one, and 52 story points in the third one. Taking a look at that, you can see the band of possibilities likely to happen in the future. You're likely to be anywhere between 50 and 55. That's the way you need to look at it. So you promising anything that is far above the mid range is foolish. And that's why we espouse empiricism because it helps us to predict what the future will be using these useful values from our own experiences. A sprint could be canceled if the sprint goal becomes obsolete. Only the product owner has the authority to cancel the sprint. Let's talk about sprint planning. Sprint planning initiates the sprint by laying out the work to be performed for the sprint. This resulting plan is created by the collaborative work of the entire Scrum team. The product owner ensures the attendees are prepared to discuss the most important product backlog items and how they map to the product goal. The Scrum team may also invite other people to attend sprint planning to provide advice. Sprint planning addresses the following topics. Topic 1. Why is this sprint valuable? The product owner proposes how the product could increase its value and utility in the current sprint. The whole scrum team then collaborates to define a sprint goal that communicates why the sprint is valuable to stakeholders. The sprint goal must be finalized prior to the end of sprint planning. Topic two, what can be done this sprint? Through discussion with the product owner, the developers select items from the product backlog to include in the current sprint. The scrum team may refine these items during this process, which increases understanding and confidence. Now, let's stop right there because the overarching idea is that we do not wait, but we are proactive to do this in backlog refinement as well. So coming into a scrum sprint planning session, the idea is as much as could have been done is done. And as much as we could get those stories to be independent, negotiable, valuable, estimable, small, and testable, we want to have done that before coming in here. By the time you come in here, it's getting too late. All right, so we want to make sure the INVEST acronym holds true as early as possible. Is it possible we come into sprint planning not having done some of it? Absolutely. But as much as we can do before we get in, we want to do it. Selecting how much can be completed within a sprint may be challenging. However, the more the developers know about their past performance, their upcoming capacity, and their definition of done, the more confident they will be in their sprint forecast. Topic three, how will the chosen work get done? For each selected product backlog item, the developers plan the work necessary to create an increment that meets the definition of done. This is often done by decomposing product backlog items into smaller work items of one day or less. How this is done is at the sole discretion 
of the developers. No one else tells them how to turn product backlog items into increments of value. Now, when I teach this to my students, I often tell them, remember the mnemonic about fries and how I avoid them. So the mnemonic goes something like this. Phil eats fries seldomly on Tuesdays. Phil eats fries seldomly on Tuesdays. Now, what does this mean? P, product. That's the product level. You decompose the product level down into the epic level. That's what the E stands for. The F stands for features. The S stands for stories, user stories. And T, which is not in the product backlog, but could be looked at as something you put as a sprint backlog decomposed item, is tasks. Tasks do not live in the product backlog. If they're going to be anywhere, they're in the sprint backlog. So here's the idea. No one else tells them how to turn product backlog items into incremental value. They know how to do this by doing it over and over again, getting good at it. It is not prescribed or talked about in the Scrum Guide. It is outside of here. The sprint goal, the product backlog item selected for the sprint, plus the plan for delivering them are together referred to as the sprint backlog. Sprint planning is time boxed to a maximum of eight hours for a one month sprint. For shorter sprints, the event is usually shorter. So you can infer that if you're working on a project and this is your very first sprint planning session, of course, the way you do things is not going to be as advanced as later on. You're also going to find that you might be spending a lot more time in the initial sessions. But as you proceed, the product owner should already have their A game with some valuation having gone on, some prioritization having gone on. There should also have been some meetings of backlog refinement to get the backlog in ship shape. So you're not just doing everything that we've mentioned coming into sprint planning. Some of it could actually have started to be done proactively prior. Sprint planning is time boxed to a minimum of eight hours for a one month sprint. So think about that. If your sprint is one month long, then you're going to spend roughly a day. If your sprint is two weeks long, then you can think about this as half a day. And that's how you can think about the time scale for doing that. Let's talk about the daily scrum. The purpose of the daily scrum is to inspect progress towards the sprint goal and adapt the sprint backlog as necessary, adjusting the upcoming planned work. The daily scrum is a 15 minute event for the developers of the scrum team. To reduce complexity, it is held at the same time and place every working day of the sprint. If the product owner or scrum master are actively working on items in the sprint backlog, they participate as developers. The developers can select whatever structure and techniques they want as long as their daily scrum focuses on progress towards the sprint goal and produces an actionable plan for the next day of work. This creates focus and improves self-management. Daily scrums improve communication, identify impediments, promote quick decision-making, and consequently eliminate the need for other meetings. The daily scrum is not the only time developers are allowed to adjust their plan. They often meet throughout the day for more detailed discussions about adapting or replanning the rest of the sprint's work. And that's the daily scrum. Now just remember on your exam, if you're asked the typical length of a daily scrum, it's a 15 minute stand up meeting is what we typically call it. But as a result of people being more sensitive to diversity and inclusion, sometimes they don't call it a stand up meeting. They may just say a daily meeting, or they may call it something else. One team that we know actually called it a daily sit-down meeting, just to include someone who was in a wheelchair. So you don't need to be rigid about what you call it. Just make sure you know what it is. And the reason why we make it 15 minutes, trying to reduce complexity, trying to make it the repeatable thing we do every day, and we want it to be quick because people don't like standing. Let's talk about the next 
ceremony. It's called Sprint Review. The purpose of the Sprint Review is to inspect the outcome of the Sprint and determine future adaptations. The Scrum team presents the results of their work to key stakeholders and progress towards the product goal is discussed. During the event, the Scrum team and stakeholders review what was accomplished in the Sprint and what has changed in the environment. Based on this information, attendees collaborate on what to do next. The product backlog may also be adjusted to meet new opportunities. The sprint review is a working session and the scrum team should avoid limiting it to a presentation. Did you catch that? Not only are we going to inspect from the perspective of the customer, from the perspective of the customer, we need to see this as an opportunity to collaborate, to give feedback. The team should also be looking for the same thing. Collaboration, feedback, clarity, understanding, paving the way for the future, and that kind of thing. The Sprint Review is the second to last event of the Sprint and is time-boxed to a maximum of four hours for a one-month Sprint. For shorter Sprints, the event is usually shorter. So if you compare and contrast the two we talked about, we talked about sprint planning and we said eight hours for a one month sprint. And now we're taking a look at the sprint review and we say four hours for a one month sprint. So you get the time scale. The time you spend planning, of course, is always more, isn't it? Even in the world of predictive. When we talk about reviewing the deliverable and deciding the way forward, it's going to be shorter. The sprint review is the second to last event of the sprint and it's time box to a maximum of four hours for a one month sprint. For shorter sprints, the event is usually shorter. Sprint retrospective. The purpose of the sprint retrospective is to plan ways to increase quality and effectiveness. The scrum team inspects how the last sprint went with regards to individuals, interactions, processes, tools, and their definition of done. Inspected elements often vary with the domain of work. Assumptions that led them astray are identified and their origins explored. The Scrum team discusses what went well during the sprint, what problems it encountered, and how those problems were or were not solved. The Scrum team identifies the most helpful changes to improve its effectiveness. The most impactful improvements are addressed as soon as possible. They may even be added to the sprint backlog for the next sprint. The sprint retrospective concludes the sprint. It is time boxed to a maximum of three hours for a one month sprint. For shorter sprints, the event is usually shorter. So again, a recap on the dynamics of time. Sprint retrospective, three hours for a one month sprint. Sprint review, four hours for a one month sprint. And sprint planning, eight hours. So you've got an idea, not to be rigid with it, but at least an idea that these events are either a full day, if we're talking about a one-month sprint and sprint planning, or half a day, pretty much, if we're talking about sprint review or sprint retrospective. Just remember, the review likely takes longer than the retrospective. So the review is four, the retrospective is three. Not to be rigid about it, but just to get you into that groove of the economies of scale. All right, so eight, four, and then three. The retrospective being the smallest, sprint planning being the largest for one month sprint. Is it possible we spend more time or less time? Absolutely, and that's why I tell people don't rigidly cram these for your exam, but just have an idea of the relative time scale. So my friends, there is one more thing I want you to be aware of when we talk about the retrospective. And that is what my buddy Roy and I typically call this. We call it Agile Vegas. Why do we call the sprint retrospective Agile Vegas? Because whatever happens in Vegas needs to stay there. If it doesn't stay there, there could be grave consequences. We don't want people going around babbling and talking about what was talked about behind closed doors. No, we want to keep it close to the vest. We want to keep it secret. Let it be the team's own secret. But we don't need to air our dirty laundry by taking all these long lessons learned lists and reports and sharing that with everyone else. No, we don't want to do that. And that is why the retrospective is very peculiar. It is not a lessons learned ceremony. No, 
It is a retrospective where we are allowed to think out loud, come clean and be honest and not expect any repercussions. That's the idea behind it. So my friends, we have come to the end of this particular section. And in our next section, we're going to talk about the artifacts. We are currently on page 10. We've just got a little bit of a ways to go before you know we're going to be done with this. But as usual, I need to ask you a few questions. So, can you name the three Scrum artifacts? Three, two, and one. Three artifacts are the product backlog, the sprint backlog, and the increment. Can you name the five scrum ceremonies? Go. Three, two, and one. When you're trying to remember this, remember the container is the sprint. In the container, you're going to have sprint planning, you're going to have the daily scrum, sprint review, sprint retrospective. Final question for today. What are the three roles in Scrum? The answer is Product Owner, Scrum Master, and the Team. I hope you found this to be useful and productive. Remember, visit the website, praiseon.com. If you're taking a look at going for the exam in Q4 and beyond of 2021, I advise you to check out our training and coaching for all things PMBOK Guide 7th Agile and Hybrid. Go on down to hybridprojectmanagement.com. Get tooled up, get wired. We're looking forward to seeing you, training you, and helping you to achieve excellence on this test. Bye for now. Hello, my friends. Welcome again to the Scrum Guide with PMP Exam Reviews. Today, we're going to be going to the section on Scrum Artifacts. You do know, as we've discussed in the past, that there's a 3-5-3 configuration in Scrum. Three roles, five ceremonies, and three artifacts. The artifacts are the product backlog, the sprint backlog, and the increment. Scrum's artifacts represent work or value. They are designed to maximize transparency of key information. Thus, everyone inspecting them has the same basis for adaptation. Each artifact contains a commitment to ensure it provides information that enhances transparency and focus against which progress can be measured. For the product backlog, it is the product goal. For the sprint backlog, it is the sprint goal. For the increment, it is the definition of done. These commitments exist to reinforce empiricism and the Scrum values for the Scrum team and their stakeholders. Let's talk about the product backlog. The product backlog is an emergent ordered list of what is needed to improve the product. So let's stop right there and let's comment on the word emergent. Emergent means it is happening real time. It means as you're going through the project, it is unfolding. So the product backlog isn't etched in stone before the beginning of the endeavor. Instead, it is a living, breathing document. Secondly, when we say an ordered list, we mean that we are refining that list in the world of the product owner, where it all happens. The product owner's focus should be on prioritizing that list of requests, which may also include some requirements. But the idea is what is high value? What needs to be done urgently? What are any associated risks that might dissuade us from working on this item? For example, if you have a low value, high risk item, 
those you shouldn't even be looking at doing. But if you have a high value, high risk item, we want to do those first. If you have a high value, low risk item, you want to do that next. And if you have a low value, low risk item, you could do that third. But you prioritize with a number of things in mind, not just that, but that is a starting point. The product backlog is the single source of work undertaken by the Scrum team. Product backlog items that can be done by the Scrum team within one sprint are deemed ready for selection in a sprint planning event. They usually acquire this degree of transparency by refining activities. Product backlog refinement is the act of breaking down and further defining product backlog items into smaller, more precise items. This is an ongoing activity to add details such as a description, order, and size. Now let's stop right there and comment on the unofficial ceremony known as backlog refinement. Now they have not coined it as a ceremony on page 10. Instead, you see the mindset of Ken and Jeff seeing that this should be an ongoing activity. Refining the product backlog shouldn't be a one-time thing that we do in the middle of the sprint. Instead, the mindset is it is an ongoing activity to add all those details, to refine the backlog, to refine the order and the size. The developers who will be doing the work are responsible for the sizing. The product owner may influence the developers by helping them understand and select trade-offs. Let's talk about commitment where the product backlog is concerned. Page 11. Commitment Product Goal The product goal describes a future state of the product which can serve as a target for the Scrum team to plan against. The product goal is in the product backlog. The rest of the product backlog emerges to define what will fulfill the product goal. A product is a vehicle to deliver value. Let's stop right there and let's tie it back into the world of the PMI. Very recently, the PMI came up with the PMBOK Guide 7th edition, and in the 7th edition, we see mention made of a value delivery system. And this espouses the idea that the project is beyond the product. The project is beyond the deliverable. Instead, the project is about the value that can be delivered. And what is value? Value defined by the PMI is the net quantifiable benefits that are given to the customer that the customer can derive from using a product, service, or result. So it's very important to look at this as a vehicle to deliver value. That's it. So a product is a vehicle to deliver value. It has a clear boundary, known stakeholders, well-defined users or customers. A product could be a service, a physical product, or something more abstract. The product goal is the long-term objective for the Scrum team. They must fulfill or abandon one objective before taking on the next. Let's move into the next artifact, the Sprint Backlog. The sprint backlog is composed of the sprint goal, why, the set of product backlog items selected for the sprint, which is what, as well as an actionable plan for delivering the increment, the how. In other words, the sprint backlog contains the why, the what, and the how. The sprint backlog is a plan by and for the developers. It is a highly visible, real-time picture of the work that the developers plan to accomplish during the sprint in order to achieve the sprint goal. Consequently, the sprint backlog is updated throughout the sprint, as Moyes learned. It should have enough detail that they can inspect the progress in the daily scrum. Let's talk about the commitment relating to the sprint backlog. Commitment, sprint goal. The sprint goal is the single objective for the sprint. Although the sprint goal is a commitment by the developers, it provides flexibility in terms of the exact work needed to achieve it. The sprint goal also creates coherence and focus, encouraging the scrum team to work together rather than on separate initiatives. The sprint goal is created during the sprint planning event 
and then add it to the sprint backlog. As the developers work during the sprint, they keep the sprint goal in mind. If the work turns out to be different than they expected, they collaborate with the product owner to negotiate the scope of the sprint backlog within the sprint without affecting the sprint goal. Now, shifting into focus for your exam, just be aware of whatever the PMI defines these items as. For example, in the Agile Practice Guide, it defines a sprint backlog as a list of work items identified by the Scrum team to be completed during the Scrum Sprint. So be aware of the language and how it's used, how it's defined in the Agile Practice Guide. Further to that point, the term sprint goal is not in the Agile Practice Guide, but understanding of it could help you better fine-tune your Scrum awareness. Let's move on to the final artifact. This is the increment. Increment, page 11. An increment is a concrete stepping stone towards the product goal. Each increment is additive to all prior increments and thoroughly verified, ensuring that all increments work together. Again, tying this back to a term you may have read about, we're talking about continuous integration. In order to provide value, the increment must be useful. Multiple increments may be created within a sprint. The sum of the increments is presented at the sprint review, thus supporting empiricism. However, an increment may be delivered to stakeholders prior to the end of the sprint. The sprint review should never be considered a gate to release in value. Now let's stop there for a second and think about what is being said. The bottom line is if value can be delivered quick, quicker than waiting for the gate, deliver the value. It's that straightforward. An increment may be delivered at the end of the sprint, but the sprint review should never be considered a gate to release in value. We want to release value as quickly as possible. Work cannot be considered part of an increment unless it meets the definition of done. Let's talk about this commitment, the definition of done. The definition of done is a formal description of the state of the increment when it meets quality measures required for the product. The moment a product backlog item meets the definition of done, an increment is born. The definition of done creates transparency by providing everyone a shared understanding of what work was completed as part of the increment. If a product backlog item does not meet the definition of done, it cannot be released or even presented at the sprint review. Instead, it returns to the product backlog for future consideration. So think about it. You're working on a sprint. You do not meet the definition of done. That item is not automatically moved into the sprint backlog for the next sprint. No, it goes to the product backlog for future consideration. If the definition of done for an increment is part of the standards of the organization, all scrum teams must follow it as a minimum. If it is not an organizational standard, the Scrum team must create a definition of done appropriate for the product. The developers are required to conform to the definition of done. Now let's hold on for a second and expand on the definition of done for your exam. Let's first of all read the definition of done in the Agile Practice Guide. It reads, a team's checklist of all the criteria required to be met so that a deliverable can be considered ready for customer use. So when you think about the definition of done, you could look at it as an organizational standard in some instances and other instances you need to look at it as a project or product criteria that must be met before a product increment is considered done. Now with that said, let us explore further definitions of this term, definition of done. Now, still in the Agile Practice Guide, let's go over to page 50. I want to show you where the definition of done could be documented. It reads, teams do not need a formal process for chartering as long as teams understand how to work together. Some teams benefit from a team chartering process. Here are some chartering ideas for team members to use as a basis for their social contract. Team values, 
working agreements. Now watch this, such as what ready means, so the team can take in work, and what done means, so the team can judge completeness consistently. And that is where we find the definition of done made mention of in the team charter. The definition of done is also talked about extensively on the Agile Alliance site. It reads, the team agrees on and displays prominently somewhere in the team room a list of criteria which must be met before a product increment, often a user story, is considered done. Failure to meet these criteria at the end of a sprint normally implies that the work should not be counted towards the sprint's velocity. Software developers have a reputation of being somewhat careless when answering the question, are you done with this feature? In fairness, this is an ambiguous question. It can mean done programming. And this is generally what a programmer or a developer will have in mind when answering. However, the meaning of interest is usually, are you done programming, creating test data, actually testing, ensuring it's deployable, and documenting? You see, proverbially to get an answer to that question is to ask, I know you are done, but are you done done? The definition of done provides a checklist which usefully guides pre-implementation activities, discussion, estimation, design. The definition of done limits the cost of rework once a feature has been accepted as done. Having an explicit contract limits the risk of misunderstanding and conflict between the development team and the customer or product owner. Let's talk about a few common pitfalls. Obsessing over a list of criteria can be counterproductive. The list needs to define the minimum work generally required to get a product increment to the done state. Individual features or user stories may have specific done criteria in addition to the ones that apply to work in general. If the definition of done is merely a shared understanding rather than spelled out and displayed on a wall, it may lose much of its effectiveness. A good part of its value lies in being an explicit contract known to all members of the team. So when we talk about done from the PMI Agile Practice Guide context, now you understand why it's talked about on page 50 as part of the team contract, social contract, team charter, if you will, team agreement. Put on a wall. Now let's move into the final section of the Scrum Guide. To round up the Scrum Guide, it reads, the developers are required to conform to the definition of done. If there are multiple Scrum teams working together on a product, they must mutually define and comply with the same definition of done. Going over to page 13, end note. Scrum is free and offered in this guide. The Scrum framework, as outlined herein, is immutable. While implementing only parts of Scrum is possible, the result is not Scrum. Scrum exists only in its entirety and functions well as a container for other techniques, methodologies, and practices. So the idea is if you are using Scrum as a container, keep it intact and put other things in it. A little bit of Scrum Guide history. Ken Schwaber and Jeff Sutherland first co-presented Scrum at the Oopsla conference in 1995. It essentially documented the learning that Ken and Jeff gained over the previous few years and made public the first formal definition of Scrum. The Scrum Guide documents Scrum as developed, evolved, and sustained for 30-plus years by Jeff Sutherland and Ken Schwaber. Other sources provide patterns, processes, and insights that complement the Scrum framework. These may increase productivity, value, creativity, and satisfaction with the results. The complete history of Scrum is described elsewhere. To honor the first places where it was tried and proven, we recognize Individual Inc., News Page, Fidelity Investments, and IDX, now GE Medical. Copyright 2020, Ken Schwaber and Jeff Sutherland. The Scrum Guide is offered for license under the Attribution Share Alike License of Creative Commons. It's accessible online and also described in summary online. By utilizing this Scrum Guide, you acknowledge and agree 
that you have read and agree to be bound by the terms of the attribution share like license of Creative Commons. To get a copy of the Scrum Guide, just go on down to scrumguides.org. I wish you all the very best as you prepare for your exam. Remember to visit Ken Schwaber's website. It's scrum.org. Scrum.org has a plethora of free Scrum mock exams. And these mock exams are for the PSM exam, the PSPO exam, and many more. Go on down to scrum.org. Thank you very much. I wish you all the very best on your test. When you get done with the PMP, if you want to tackle the PSM exam, I highly recommend it. I have done that. My buddy Roy has done that. And many of our students have done so. They find tremendous value going to the next level in Scrum. Also, don't forget, the Certified Scrum Master exam is also not a bad one. You take a course that is meant to be a solid course with the Scrum Alliance. You take a pretty straightforward exam afterwards. But the industry value of any of these certifications is huge. The PSM exam is a little bit more challenging than the CSM exam. But ultimately, the package will help you. It's cheaper to get the PSM than the CSM, so you may want to take that on first since it's low risk, low cost. You take care, and I'll speak to you soon.